me now is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York. He's a member of the House Judiciary Committee's Over-Criminalization Task Force. They're holding hearings on how to fix this broken system. And Joshua Dubois, he's a former spiritual advisor to President Obama. He wrote a cover story of this very topic titled The Fight for Black Men for a recent issue of Newsweek. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Evening, Rev. Thank you for having us. Congressman Jeffries, many people like Bill O'Reilly, uh, 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 they're like that in that they clip, they, they ignore the fact that blacks are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. What's your task force doing to change it? Well, African Americans are overrepresented at every level. Uh, we're more likely to be arrested, more likely to be charged, more likely to be prosecuted, and more likely to be convicted and then get longer sentences for the same offense, as you pointed out. Under the House Judiciary Committee's uh, chairmanship, uh, Chairman Goodlatte has, to his credit, uh, appointed a task force that's bipartisan in nature, five Democrats, five Republicans, both of us charged with the responsibility of looking at the reality of overcriminalization in America, more than a million people incarcerated, mm. a disproportionate number of those individuals, African American, are more incarcerated people in America than in any other country in the world uh, as a proportion of our population. It is costly from the standpoint of the loss of economic productivity and human capital. It's have a devastating impact uh, on inner city communities predominated by African Americans and Latinos. Uh, and we've been charged with the responsibility over the next six months to look at ways in which we can deal with this overcriminalization dynamic in America. Now, Joshua, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do out of this trial is not just deal with just the trial, but raise the big, broad issues that really play into all of this and put a spotlight on them. For example, it's not just the current system, it's a system facing black youth. A white male born in 2001 has a 6% chance of spending time in prison, but a black male born in that same year has a 32% chance of spending time in prison. That's exactly right, and it, it's a vicious cycle, Reverend Sharpton, and it starts really early on. Those same rates, those same disproportionate rates are um, applicable to the rates of suspension and expulsion from school. Um, the way that we approach young black men is um, through a climate of fear, not unlike how George Zimmerman approached um, Trayvon Martin, a climate of suspicion. Um, and, and that starts in our elementary schools and in our middle schools, and by the time they reach high school and, and college, um, as you said, and as the congressman said it as well, where incarcerating them at, at much higher rates than everyone else. But I, I do think it starts early. It starts in, in, in our earliest grades. Now, Congressman, it's, it's policies like in New York, we uh, have a policy of stop and frisk that are a big part of this unjust system. And it doesn't even work. In 2012, the New York Police Department conducted over 533,000 stops. 85% of the stops were black and Latino, and 89% of them were totally innocent. It's not even a good crime-fighting uh, policy. It's not a good crime-fighting policy in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people who are stopped, questioned, and frisked, there's no gun, no weapon, no drugs, no contraband. Nothing at all. And what it also does, Reverend Sharpton, as you know, is it poisons the relationship between the police and the community because the community views the police for good reason often as a hostile, conquering entity that views innocent, law-abiding individuals as potential criminals. And so where there should be uh, cooperation, there's great contention. And that's a significant problem. It's unfortunate, uh, but it's symbolic of the notion that African Americans generally, and in particular African American men, tend to be viewed from a suspicious criminal right. lens very different than any other person in America. Joshua, and in fact, it, it, you would want young black men to grow up trusting police, looking up to police, wanting to be one. Look at uh, what your black youth say about stop and frisk. Let me give you an example. Mm. 
A lot of times I ask them, you know, what's the reason for you stopping me? They don't have an answer for me. They say, just turn around. Why me? You know, like, like I didn't do anything. I'm just cruising by. How could they mistake me for someone else? When I do get stopped, I mean, it does make me feel like I have no type of rights or anything like that. It's the most dominated you could really feel standing on two feet is having your hands on the wall, uh, having somebody patting you up and down, another person surveilling and watching and documenting it. So you have this hostility yeah. that's built up, innocent people that feel they've been criminalized. Then you have another element that goes to jail at disproportionate numbers. And then when they leave jail, you write in your article about how the system follows people even after they leave jail. And that is uh, the result. This is your writing. The result of all this is that is, is the undercast. And, uh, and, and, and I think that your whole article went to the fact that you build a permanent kind of underclass and undercast that very few of them break out of. That's right. It's really hard to break out of it. When you return from incarceration, it's that much more difficult to get a job, to get health insurance, to provide for your family. But, you know, the way to address this is, is not just to tell the statistics, although that's absolutely shocking. It's to do what you and Attorney General Holder and so many others do, which is to tell our stories. You know, um, the, the reality is that the vast majority of this country thinks the criminal justice system is working just fine. And the only way to break that down is to tell them the real personal stories of, of, uh, of the the moments when it wasn't working. Um, that's how we humanize these young African-American men. That's how uh, people like George Zimmerman don't look at Trayvon Martin and see a nameless, faceless hoodie, uh, but they see someone who's a son, who's a brother, who's a student, who has hopes and dreams. I think that's really where the hope and the promise is. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries and Joshua Dubois, thank you both.